So my name is Ken Johnson. I am a horticulture educator uh, with U of I Extension. Uh, my office is in Jacksonville. Uh, and tonight we're going to talk about uh, carnivorous plants. Uh, to begin, we'll kind of talk about kind of the general characteristics of carnivorous plants, some of the different ways they go about capturing their food, and then we'll get into the uh, cultivation part um, of the program. All right, so first off, what are carnivorous plants? Uh, so there's a couple of different things that a plant has to be able to do in order for it to be considered carnivorous. Uh, first thing, obviously, is they have to capture and kill their prey, whether this be insects, uh, small animals, stuff like that. Uh, once they capture that food, they have to have some way to digest that uh, prey. And then they also have to benefit from those nutrients um, that they've taken have to benefit from the nutrients taken up from the prey. It doesn't do them any good to, to catch them, break them down, but then not um, derive any benefit from doing that. So those are the three criteria uh, that plants typically need to uh, meet in order to be considered carnivorous. So how do they go about catching their food? Um, there are kind of five main ways that carnivorous plants will, will go about catching their food. Uh, pitfall traps, lobster pot traps, adhesive or flypaper traps, snap traps, and suction traps. Uh, those first three are kind of passive ways, uh, so the plants really don't uh, do anything. They make these traps um, and attract their prey. Uh, the last two, the snap and suction, uh, that actually involves the plant moving in some way to capture their food. And we'll talk a little bit about each of these individually and how they work. So first up, we've got the pitfall traps. Uh, these are just going to be modified leaves. Uh, you can see in these pictures here, uh, they're just kind of a, a tube, basically, and this is going to be filled with liquid. Uh, a lot of times they're going to be brightly colored. This is going to attract insects. And if you look out into a field uh, with some of our pitcher plants, you see a lot of green. Uh, and then you see these colorful pitcher plants uh, sticking up. That's going to attract the insects. Uh, some of them will also produce nectar. So you can see here in this picture on the right, we've got a surfeit fly there. Uh, it is crawling around on the rim of this pitcher. It is probably producing nectar there, so this fly is, is feeding on that. And hopefully, from the plant's perspective, that fly uh, will find its way into that trap. A lot of times, these pitcher plants will also produce nectar on the back of the hood right here, too. So insects will come and feed on that as well. And sometimes they'll also be fragrant. Uh, again, another way to attract insects to them. The lip of these of these traps are going to be slippery. Uh, so again, uh, this lip part right here uh, is going to be kind of slippery. So when insects are walking on that, they will easily lose their footing and then fall down into that trap. A lot of them will also have downward facing hairs. And you can see that in the picture on the bottom here. You see these little white hairs are all pointing down. And this is going to prevent those insects from crawling up back out of the trap. And the inside of the tra trap is also going to be waxy, again, so they can't get their footing and climb out of it. A uh, majority of these plants that have these pitfall traps are going to have hoods over the opening. So you can see that in these top two pictures. Uh, and these hoods are going to prevent water, uh, rainwater from getting into these traps and kind of diluting everything. The plants also have ways to pump water in and out uh, of these traps. But those hoods just kind of help prevent a lot of water from getting in. Uh, some species of pitcher plants don't have um, hoods. So this pic uh, picture on the bottom, this purple pitcher plant, their hoods don't actually cover the opening, so rainwater will fill those uh, periodically. Next up are lobster pot traps, and these are fairly similar to our pitfall traps. For these, uh, you have an opening on the trap. So if you look at this picture on the left, you can see this opening uh, right here, and on the right, the opening is right there, and that's going to be kind of facing down, so the insect is going to crawl up in there, find their way in there. And for the most part, when insects try to escape, they're going to fly up. And these traps are going to have these kind of white cell areas, and that's going to let light through. So the insects are going to be attracted to that light. They're going to think they're going to be able to get out, and they'll just fly up and keep bumping into that part of the plant. And eventually, they'll tire. And again, from the plant's perspective, hopefully fall down into that trap where they can digest them. Occasionally, they will find their way out of the trap, but more often than not, uh, they'll get stuck in there. And these are similar to the traps uh, that are used to catch, catch lobsters in the ocean. Same idea behind them. Next up are the flypaper traps. And these plants are going to produce a sticky substance that's going to capture the prey. Uh, this is going to be produced from glands that are on stalks. So you can see these stalks 
on the sundew on the right here, uh, these red stalks, and they have a little gland up top there. And when we talk about sundews, you can get some better pictures of that. Um, they'll produce this sticky substance. A lot of times it's going to be sweet tasting. So the insects will go. They'll start feeding on that. They'll get stuck in there. They'll get all gummed up, and they won't be able to escape from that. And then these, uh, these tentacles, these glands, are also going to produce those digestive enzymes that are going to break down those insects that they're going to be gaining their nutrients from. Next up, we have our snap traps. And these are going to be active traps. Uh, so for these plants, they're going to have, they have two lobes, uh, in the case of Venus flytrap, two lobes to their leaves. And on these leaves, they have these little trigger hairs. You know, when we get to Venus flytraps, I have some better pictures of that. Uh, so when we insects walk across those, they'll trigger those trigger hairs, and that will cause the traps to close. Uh, close on those, those insects, and as they kind of struggle, um, that'll get the plant to start releasing those digestive enzymes, and again, start breaking them down. In the case of Venus flytrap, after several days, um, those traps can then open back up, and all will be left is the, the kind of the, the dead husk of that insect, and that trap will be able to, to catch more insects. Last type of trap is going to be our bladder traps, and this is another active trap. And these are going to be found in aquatic situations. So for these, uh, you've got this little uh, trap down here, uh, so this little white thing down here. That's going to be the trap, and the plants are going to pump water out of those traps, so it's just going to be filled with air. Uh, and then when a, a small aquatic invertebrate uh, swims by that, they have these trigger hairs. It's kind of hard to see in this picture, but there's a little straight thing sticking out, and they have hairs on that. When that aquatic invertebrate gets close by, that'll trigger those trigger hairs. It'll open up a trap door, and that's going to cause some suction. Water's going to rush into that, as, long, as well as that little invertebrate. That trap door will then shut, and the plant can then start breaking down their food. So once they have captured their food, they then have to have a way to digest it. Otherwise, there's really no point in catching it. So... One way they'll do this, there's kind of three different ways they'll do this. One way is going to be enzymes. So they're going to create these digestive enzymes to help break down food. Uh, similar to the, what we do in our stomachs, we'll release enzymes and stuff to break down food. They will also, some will also use bacteria. Uh, and these bacteria are going to break down that food. Um, again, similar to humans, we have bacteria in our guts to help break down food. These plants will also do that. And then others will use um, other critters, so to speak, so whether that be um, insect larvae, stuff like that. They will feed on that food. Uh, when they defecate, those plants will then take that up. So this picture here are some midge larvae. Those are flies. that are going to live inside of this particular plant, and they'll then consume that food and break down that food to a source that the plants can then take up the nutrients. Um, there are some plants uh, that have assassin bugs that will go around. They will The plants will capture the food. The assassin bugs will go feed on that insect. And as they're feeding, they will defecate on that plant, and that plant uh, will use that for ass for nutrients. And plants can use, they don't necessarily use, just use one of these. They can use one, two, or all of these different techniques to break down their food. So where do carnivorous plants grow? Uh, they're going to be found in a wide variety of habitats, but all of them are going to have at least, at some point in the year, um, kind of four main characteristics. They're going to be found in nutrient-poor areas. Uh, it doesn't really make any sense to grow in areas where you can get lots of nutrients. There's no benefit to being carnivorous. Um, they've filled this niche in nutrient-poor areas. They get their nutrients from insects. If you go and do that in a, in a, in a situation the soil that has a lot of nutrients in it, they're going to get out-competed because those other plants don't have to put the resources into that carnivory part. These areas generally have abundant light. Uh, if you think about it, a lot of other plants aren't going to grow all that well in these nutrient-poor areas. So a lot of times you're not going to have a lot of trees, uh, shrubs, stuff like that in a lot of these areas. So you're going to have lots of light. Generally, there's going to be an abundant amount of water. You think a lot of times of bogs, stuff like that for these carnivorous plants. Uh, some will grow in more sandy soils, and it could be real dry for parts of the year. But at some point in the year, there's going to be a good amount of moisture for these plants to grow in. And these areas also tend to have high humidity, so again, a lot of moisture in the air for these plants. And this is particularly important, the high humidity part, uh, for some of our plants that have the sticky traps. If you get real dry air, they're not going to be able to produce that, that sticky substance uh, as well. It's going to dry out too quickly. 
So when it comes to carnivorous plants, there's about 594 species of carnivorous plants. Uh, again, that kind of depends on, on what source you read. Some people are more clumpers, some are more splitters when it comes to taxonomy, but, but generally around 600 species of plants. And that may seem a lot, uh, but in the grand scheme of things, when it comes to plants, there's about there's over 390,000 plant species. So only about a tenth of a percent of the plants that we know of on Earth are carnivorous. So not really even a drop in the bucket when it comes to plants. Now the plants we're going to talk about are some of the more numerous species, uh, the more have the most species in them. So our bladderworts, our sundews, our tropical pitcher pants, uh, butterworts, these have a lot of different species in them. And these are also going to be the most commonly uh, grown plants, especially for beginners. So the first group are bladderworts. These are going to have the, the bladder traps. And they're going to live in a wide variety of habitats, but they're going to be terrestrial and a, so they're split into terrestrial and aquatic. So you have species that will live um, in waterlogged soils, lakes, streams, uh, stuff like that. All of them are going to have abundant water because those bladder traps aren't going to work um, without a lot of moisture. These traps are going to be below ground in the case of terrestrial species or underwater. So the pictures here, this top one, that is going to be an aquatic species. On the bottom, uh, that is a terrestrial. And you know these aren't, you know, these aren't anything like Venus flytrap where you can see them catching their food. Um, generally, they're pretty small. You can't see the traps. So most people uh, will grow these for their flowers. Here you can see some of those flowers. They have quite pretty flowers. Um, pinks, purples, white, yellow, red, a lot of different colors. Uh, and if you get a, a pretty good clump of these, you can, they can produce, put out quite a few flowers. It's quite pretty. Um, these flowers, again, are also fairly small. So you need, a lot of times you need a fairly good uh, mass of it to get an impressive display. Uh, several of these flowers here, or that we see here, uh, these plants are native to Illinois. So this plant right here, uh, this is a purple bladderwort. Um, this is an aquatic species that is native to Illinois. Uh, in the middle, both of these are native to Illinois. These are, uh, top one is the horn bladderwort. The bottom is a lavender bladderwort. And both of these are terrestrial uh, as well. Next group are the sundews. Um, and this, these have a large diversity of leaf shapes. We'll show you some pictures of that in the next slide. These are going to have those sticky traps, so these have tentacles with glands on the ends. And you can see that a little better on this bottom picture. So these stalks, they just have this little red glob uh, that's got the gland on the end, and that gland is going to really, uh, produce that sticky substance, so that clear stuff right there. And that's how they get their name. It look like they're covered in dew. Uh, these glands, again, are going to produce a nectar-like substance, so it's going to be sweet. Uh, insects will be attracted to that. They will then feed on that. That substance is sticky. They'll get all gummed up and won't be able to get away. And then eventually those glands will start to release those digestive enzymes to break them down. Uh, a lot of these sundews, these tentacles will move. So you can see this picture on top here. They will actually start to fold over towards that prey. So again, they can cover them thoroughly in that sticky substance and those digestive enzymes. And a lot of them also, the leaf will start to fold over. So this leaf will kind of curl up again, getting good coverage all over uh, all of that insect. Uh, here are some pictures of just different uh, leaf types. Uh, so we've got kind of round leaves on here, um, up here, more spoon shaped, uh, kind of spatula shaped, and the kind of thread like uh, leaves on these. So again, wide diversity. Generally, uh, those stalks are going to be red. There are some a little more white in color, uh, but usually more reddish. And this is one, again, you need high humidity to get uh, good dew formation. And a lot of times, the more sunlight you get on these, the more of a red color you get. Next up are our tropical pitcher plants. So these are, are found in Southeast Asia. Uh, they are broken up into highland and lowland species. So our highland species are going to be able to tolerate a little cooler temperatures uh, here in Illinois. Um, probably be a little more successful than those. You can grow them outside during the summer. Uh, I have some that grow on our porch, and I just bring them indoors during the winter. Uh, lowland species require warmer temperatures, a lot higher humidity, so they're a little more difficult to grow. You need a greenhouse um, or a terrarium, something like that, in order to grow those. Generally, they're going to grow as uh, climbing or scrambling vines. So climbing vines are going to climb up trees, other plants, stuff like that. Scrambling vines are just going to grow along the floor. Uh, the pitchers, you can see in this picture, they're going to form at the end of those leaves. So they have this kind of stalk right here, and then that pitcher will form. 
a lot of times you can find a lot of different um, organisms growing, uh, living in these pitchers, um, different invertebrates, bacteria, insects, stuff like that. A lot of times they're, they kind of call them like kind of little mini lakes. They have uh, such a diversity of, of organisms living in them. Again, there's a wide diversity of, of pitcher types when it comes to these. The leaves generally look the same, and these big glossy looking leaves, um, but a lot of different types of pitchers here. Uh, this top one right here, you can see these little white things. These are mosquito larvae, uh, so that's just an example of some of the different organisms that will live in there. Those will feed on bacteria and stuff like that, um, and then their their frass and stuff will the, the plants can feed on that for their nutrients. Some of these plants. Uh, they will have upper and lower pitchers, so they're, the pitchers produced by the, the top part of the plant are going to look, look different than the lower part. So a lot of that, um, when it comes into kind of the horticultural trade, a lot of people like uh, those those plants because you have those different types of pitchers. Um, there can also be a diversity of pitchers right here on that same plant. So a lot of different unique shapes and stuff like that as well. you got more kind of a toilet bowl shape right here. you kind got your more traditional long, thin traps right there. Next group are going to be our butterworts and these are also going to have adhesive traps. Uh, these are going to produce a rosette of succulent leaves and next slide I got some, a couple different examples of that. Uh, leaves are also often going to produce a fungus like odor. A lot of times these are going to be attracting insects like fungus gnats, uh, small uh, flies. So they'll, they'll be attracted to that fungal odor. Uh, they will then go investigate that and get caught on those leaves and then digested. Um, in Scandinavian countries, um, Sweden, Norway, uh, these are, in the past have been used to curdle milk into a buttermilk-like fermented product. Um, and I, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce what they call it, um, but if you're really interested, you can just do a, an internet search for that. Um, and these will also uh, produce showy flowers, so a lot of people will grow these again uh, for their flowers. So here you can see some of those different types of flowers. You got our white, pink, uh, purple, yellow. There's some red um, plants out there as well. And in the middle here, we've got some of the different leaf forms. So a little more kind of open rosette here down at the bottom. Leaves aren't quite as thick. And then up on top there in the middle, um, a little more compact, fleshy leaves on that, that particular plant. Uh, next group, uh, pitcher plants. Um, the Saracenia are North American pitcher plants. Um, all of these are going to be native to North America. The majority of them are going to be found um, in the southeast United States along the Gulf Coast. Uh, depending, on the, depending on the source, between 8 and 11 species of these. Uh, we do have uh, one that is native to Illinois, the purple pitcher plant, and that goes up into Canada, um, I think even into Alaska as well. And these will re readily hybridize. So if you get into growing carnivorous plants um, and you start you know, looking for plants to purchase, there are a tremendous amount of different hybrids out there um, of these pitcher plants. Again, just some examples of these. Uh, so we kind of have two different types. We've got our trumpet type pitcher plants. So these are long, uh, tall leaves. Some of these can get a couple feet tall. Uh, again, some examples over here, two different species. Uh, and then on the top right there, that's the purple pitcher plant. These are a lot shorter, um, kind of fatter, more squat uh, plants. And these also, you can see, they don't have that hood necessarily covering that opening, whereas our trumpet pitcher plants um, cover that that opening a little bit better. Uh, and then here, it's, um, this is what the pitcher plant flower looks like. It's, it's a pretty unique looking flower. Um, it kind of hangs down. It's pretty interesting looking if you ever get a chance to see one. Uh, next up, uh, this is the last one uh, we'll talk about, uh, the Venus flytrap. Um, and this is how generally how most people get uh, kind of involved and get into growing carnivorous plants. You pick one of these up from a nursery, a hardware store, a grocery store, something like that, in those little uh, plastic uh, cubes. And most people have heard about the Venus flytrap. These plants are native to the coastal bogs of North and South Carolina. Uh, their, their populations are dwindling. I believe they're just now threatened. Um, primarily due to habitat loss, um, you know, their habitats being turned into housing development, shopping malls, stuff like that. Uh, for these, uh, so we talk about the trigger hairs. Uh, you can see down here, this is a real big a close up of that trigger hair. Uh, so if, say, uh, for example, a fly lands in that, 
that trap, it hits one of those trigger hairs as it's crawling around, it's going to have to hit a second trigger hair within 20 seconds for that trap to close. Once that happens, that second trigger hair is closed, that trap will close on that fly. Uh, they do this to kind of prevent uh, stuff like raindrops, stuff like that, just random things from falling in there, prevent that trap from closing um, unnecessarily. It requires a lot of energy for them to close that trap and then open back up again. And then once they've closed, that insect is going to struggle around, and those traps need to be triggered, I believe it's like five more times. Um, once that happens, then they will start releasing those digestive enzymes to break down uh, that insect again to try to prevent um, try to prevent them from wasting energy on trying to digest something that's already dead that they're not going to gain any nutrients from. Uh, here's some more pictures of Venus flytraps. So I put some pictures of flowers in here. Uh, generally, it's recommended that you don't let your plants uh, flower. It requires a lot of energy, uh, not only to produce the flowers, but once they start to produce seed, they put a lot of energy into that. And a lot of times, that can set plant, plants back quite a bit. So generally recommended to cut those flower stalks off. So now you've had a chance to see those flowers. Uh, and again, once you kind of get into the horticulture part of Venus flytraps, there are a lot of different, uh, a lot of variety in the different uh, trap shapes, a lot of different cultivars and stuff out there. So you've got these cup traps up here. Uh, this one's called Fused Tooth. Uh, I think it's a red dragon. So a lot of different cultivars um, when it comes to um, Venus flytraps. A lot of different stuff out there. All right, so we've kind of talked, done a general overview of some of the more common uh, carnivorous plants. Now we'll get into how to, how to grow them. And again, we're going to cover these same plants are more commonly grown especially for begin when it comes to beginners, uh, commonly grown plants. All right, so for light, remember, out, remember in the beginning we talked about plants need full light, so at least uh, six plus hours full sun. Some of the butterworts you can get away with partial sun. Uh, tropical pitcher plants a lot of times diffuse or partly sunny. Uh, so the tropical pitcher plants I have I grow on our porch, uh, which is north facing, um, and it's bright enough out there that I don't have any problem with them producing pitchers uh, or anything like that. Um, if you're, so that's if you're growing outdoors. If you're growing indoors, um, you know, put them in a windowsill. Uh, use fluorescent or LED lights. A lot of times the fluorescent lights, people are going to use T5. Uh, those have a lot higher output than our standard uh, light fixtures, which are going to be T8 or T12 uh, that we have in our homes. So T5 is going to put out uh, more light. And with LEDs becoming cheaper and cheaper, uh, I think a lot of people are starting to go that route as well. Uh, water, uh, this is one of the bigger mistakes people make when it comes to growing carnivorous plants. Uh, if you think about where they live, again, nutrient poor areas, there's not a lot of nutrients, uh, minerals, stuff like that in the water, so you need to use pure, uh, low mineral water. Uh, typically, they say that dissolved solids need to be less than 50 parts per million. So for most of us, that means you're not going to be using tap water or well water. Again, those have a lot of minerals and salts in them, um, and that can cause a lot of damage to the roots if you use that um, repeatedly. That stuff will build up in the soil. Um, and can kill your plants. So you're going to want to use purified, um, either through that's been distilled or reverse osmosis, um, or catch rainwater uh, to water your plants. Most plants, um, we can do the tray method. Uh, so basically, you're going to put your pots into a shallow tray, fill that with water, um, and that water will just kind of work its way up, kind of wick up that soil into the pots. Um, this is also going to help. Uh, with humidity, especially if you're growing inside, you know, having that tray of water, as that water evaporates, that'll increase the humidity around those plants. And also, if you're growing indoors, especially in the winter, where we get, get some pretty low humidities when we're heating our houses, uh, maybe a good idea to run a humidifier around your plants. Our soil or our growing media, uh, you don't want to use our typical potting soil. Again, a lot of those times, a lot of times they have fertilizers in them, so that's going to burn up the roots. Um, they just don't have, really have the right composition uh, in there for use with carnivorous plants. Uh, generally, um, you can grow them in a mix of peat moss, perlite, long fibered sphagnum moss, or sand. Um, when it comes to the sphagnum moss, make sure you're getting sphagnum moss uh, and not Spanish moss. Spanish moss is the stuff that grows on trees down in the southeast. Um, that stuff is poisonous to your carnivorous plants, so make sure it is sphagnum moss. Kind of the default mix that works well 
Uh, with most carnivorous plants, it's going to be one part peat moss, uh, one part coarse sand. So that peat moss is going to retain a lot of moisture, uh, but that sand is going to help make it a little bit looser so it's not too heavy, doesn't retain too much moisture, so you can still get air to the roots of those plants. Uh, so some a little more specific uh, soil mixes. Um, and when it comes to soil mixes, uh, you know, everybody's, a lot of people have their own kind of special mixes. You know, some people will swear you need to use this, others will say you need to use that. Um, these are just kind of, a lot of people will agree that these are fairly good, but, you know, the more you read, there's a lot of different stuff out there. So kind of, you know, experiment, find out what works for you. Some will work for others and not, some people not for others. So for our pitcher plants, our Venus flytraps and our sundews, uh, two parts peat, one part perlite. Again, that peat's going to hold that moisture. That perlite's going to kind of loosen that soil up. Uh, butterworts, for our temperate butterworts, uh, two parts peat, one part sand, one part perlite, so they like a little bit looser soil. Uh, then Mexican, or our tropical, uh, equal parts sand, perlite, vermiculite, and peat. Our tropical pitcher plants, uh, these like um, are fairly well-drained. They need to be consistently moist, but need a well-drained soil, so we're going to use long fi fiber sphagnum, uh, one part orchid bark, one part perlite, one part vermiculite. So again, that long fiber sphagnum is going to hold on to that moisture, but that other stuff is going to make a nice, uh, good, loose soil for those. Now, bladderworts, uh, for our terrestrial species, again, these like, uh, are going to need a little more waterlogged soils for those bladder traps to work popularly, pop, uh, properly, uh, so we're going to need one part peat, one part sand. When it comes to containers, it's going to be best to use plastic or glazed ceramic pots. I uh, start using unglazed terracotta pots. Uh, those are going to be porous. They're going to wick the water out of that soil, and they will dry out rather quickly. Um, and a lot of times you can get, especially if you're using tap water, you can get salts accumulating in that terracotta. Uh, so it's best, best to avoid those or you're going to be watering uh, those plants a lot more often than you would have to otherwise. Uh, feeding plants. Um, so this is a question a lot of people have. If you're growing your plants outdoors, you don't really need to feed them. They will catch insects on their own. Uh, growing them indoors, um, that's more when you need to think about do you need to feed them or not. Feed them or not. Uh, when it comes to fertilizers, um, just like soil mixes, everybody's kind of got their own opinion on this. Some people say yes. Um, other people say absolutely not, never do it. Um, but if you, and so if you do decide to do it, uh, make sure you're using some sort of dilute uh, fertilizer. Usually people are going to be using a half to quarter strength. Uh, a lot will use um, orchid fertilizer, epiphyte fertilizer, so stuff that's fairly low analysis to begin with, and then dilute that even more. Again, these aren't plants that grow in nutrient-rich areas. They're not used to a lot of having a lot of nutrients, so you don't want to burn those plants up uh, by using fertilizers. Some people with the pitcher plants and stuff, They'll take Osmocote or something like that, put a single granule um, into those pitchers in order to fertilize them. Again, you're growing indoors. Uh, more than likely, uh, you're not going to have too many insects in there, uh, so you can you know, go outside and catch insects. Uh, for some of like larger beetles, larger caterpillars, keep in mind grasshoppers, stuff like that, that have good, strong chewing mouth parts. They can potentially chew through uh, your plants, so make sure you're not getting insects that are too large. Uh, if you have a pet store in town, uh, it's particularly one that sells stuff for uh, reptiles, stuff like that, crickets, mealworms, stuff like that, you can go and buy those and feed those to your, your plants as well. Uh, some people will use uh, frozen blood worms, uh, stuff like that to feed their plants. So if you're growing outside, not necessarily growing inside, probably something uh, you may want to think about doing. So if we're growing indoors, uh, if you're going to be growing in a window still, uh, you want windows that have east, southeast, west, or southwest exposure. Um, in the northern hemisphere, that's where we're going to get most of our, our light coming through. Uh, you're probably still going to need to use some supplemental lighting, especially when we get um, into winter if you're growing some of the tropical species. Um, our day length during the winter isn't as long. The sun intensity and angle isn't as great as it is in the summer. So supplemental lighting, whether that be fluorescent or LED lights. I mean, again, your plants need high humidity. So if you're using the tray method, that can help with the humidity, or you may have to use um, a humidifier to get that high humidity that you need. Uh, a lot of people also use terrariums. Uh, so using old fish tanks, you know, build your own, something like that. 
And again, you're going to be using uh, grow lights for these, whether it be fluorescent or LED. Uh, particularly with your fluorescent, you want to leave a gap there uh, between the top of your, your terrarium and the light fixture. Um, those can put out a lot of heat, uh, so you can cook your plants if you don't if you get those lights too close. Uh, so leave a little bit of a gap. Some people will get uh, small fans, put them in there so you get air movement. Um, you don't necessarily want that real still stagnant air. You can start getting disease problems. If you can get a little bit of air movement in there, uh, it'll help quite a bit. Uh, dormancy. So a lot of our carnivorous plants go through a dormant period, particularly our, our, our temperate species are. Uh, for the most part, it's going to be a shorter photo, photo period, so shorter days, cooler temps. Uh, for the most part, again, uh, some of our Australian uh, uh, sundews, they go hot, dormant during the real hot, dry summers. Um, but most plants that people are going to be growing is going to be our, our, our winter dormancy. Uh, so if these plants are hardy uh, to where you're growing them, so some of our, like our purple pitcher plant that's native to Illinois, uh, some of the sundews that are native to Illinois, if you're growing those outdoors, you know, you can just leave them outdoors. They will overwinter just fine. Uh, if they're not quite hardy, you're probably going to need to bring them inside, put them in a cool windowsill. Um, you know, this, this may be a benefit if you live in an old drafty house. Those windowsills will definitely be nice and cool. But generally, windowsills, even if you have nice, you know, energy efficient windows are going to be a little bit cooler. Uh, put them in a room that you don't use very often. You kind of close off um, just so it's it's cool, but they're still going to need light. Um, so window cells are good. You may have to supplement the light a little bit. Uh, garage or basement, um, if you're going to be doing that, then you're definitely going to need to bring in lights because that's not going to be cold enough in those areas usually for them to go into a real deep dormancy. So they will still be photosynthesizing, so they'll still need light. Uh, kind of the last resort is using a refrigerator. Um, you put your plants you know, in a plastic bag, put them in the refrigerator. Refrigerator is going to be cold enough that they'll go into a deep dormancy uh, and they're not going to need lights. Uh, but generally, you, you want to use that as a last resort. Try to use uh, the windowsill, garage, or basement uh, before you resort to the refrigerator. Uh, growing outdoors. So when it comes to growing outdoors, uh, there's a lot of different ways you're going to do this. Most of us are probably not going to have soils that are going to be conducive to growing carnivorous plants. So you're going to have to, um, you know, if you're going to put them in the ground, you're going to have to dig a hole, uh, line it with a pond liner, then put your carnivorous plant soil mixture in there. Um, this is my backyard. I got a preformed pond, dug a hole, stuck it in there, um, and then filled that with my, my soil mix. Uh, when you're doing your pond liners or your preformed uh, ponds, a lot of times you're going to want to put uh, some holes three to five inches below the soil surface so you can drain off some of that excess water. Again, some plants are not going to like having that consistently constant waterlogged soils. Um, you can kill your plants that way. So let them let that top of that soil uh, dry out a little bit. Still be moist, but you don't want it uh, waterlogged. You can also use large containers, large pots uh, to grow these plants. Uh, when it comes to the layout, it's going to be similar to producing in any other garden bed. Kind of think about how it's going to be viewed. You know, if it's going to be viewed from all angles, put your taller plants in the middle, shorter plants in the front. Viewed from one particular side, taller plants in the back. Uh, try to put your taller plants uh, to the north so they're not shading out your shorter plants. Uh, if you have a large enough area, you, know, you can put some depression areas in there so you can put your more lover, water loving plants in those, like your bladder worts. Um, you can have a little higher areas uh, for plants that don't like being waterlogged, stuff like Venus fly traps, stuff like that. So you can kind of play around uh, with that a little bit. Um, and again, over winter, you know, if it's hardy for Illinois, you can leave them just the way they are. They'll be fine. Um, if they are, aren't are hardy to Illinois, um, either you, know, you can put them in pots and sink them in to that during the year and then pull those pots out and overwinter them inside. Um, or after a real hard frost, um, you can mulch that outdoor growing area and try to overwinter your plants that way. All right, so what can you grow outside? Uh, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden has a list of carnivorous plants um, that do well in different zones. Uh, so for zone five, uh, so for Illinois, that's going to be uh, northern Illinois. That's going to be purple pitcher plants. Um, you're going to want to look for the, the preparia subspecies. There are a couple different subspecies that preparia is going to be a little more cold hardy some of the other ones. Again, that's native to Illinois. 
round leaf sundew, English sundew, common butterwort. These should all do just fine growing in zone five or colder. So you can grow these outdoors year round. Uh, zone six, so I'll get a little more into the southern and central Illinois here. Uh, you can try doing trumpet pitcher plant, sweet pitcher plant, and again, any of our subspecies of purple pitcher plants should do okay uh, outdoors year round. And then zone seven through 10, so if you're kind of extreme southern Illinois, um, this could be you. So we've got our Venus flytraps. Uh, most of our, our American North American pitcher plants, uh, most temperate and warm temperate sundews, and most of the butterworts can be grown outdoors year round. They get an unexpected real cold snap. Um, you can just cover these plants and they should uh, make it through just fine. Uh, University of Illinois, uh, the garden they have in Urbana, they have some carnivorous plants. Um, these are the plants that they grow um, outdoors um, here in Illinois. Uh, so the Drosera bonata, uh, the only cinder that they really seem to be able to get to grow outdoors. Um, milder climates, the Drosera filiformis, probably more southern Illinois. And then these different Saracenia species, the North American pitcher plants, they also grow. Uh, so for this, they will uh, mulch this. They usually do it in November, December. Um, they will mulch that to overwinter this. Um, and then come spring, they'll remove that mulch um, and let stuff start growing again. So when it comes to uh, finding carnivorous plants in Illinois, uh, there is one location that I know of, um, Volo Bog State Natural Area up in Ingleside, so up north of Chicago, they have some purple pitcher plants there. Um, I went there this summer, so these pictures, some pictures I took this summer uh, from there. So if you are interested in seeing these in the wild, um, these are some places you can get, this place, one place you can go in Illinois. Um, there may be others, um, but this is the one that's publicly accessible that I know about. A lot of our carnivorous plants were found in the Chicago area. Um, city of Chicago, used, that area used to be really boggy. Um, obviously now it is mostly urban area. So a lot of the habitat that we had in Illinois uh, for carnivorous plants just doesn't exist anymore. All right, so, so what we did tonight is just kind of a real quick um, overview um, of growing carnivorous plants, kind of enough to make you dangerous. Um, there's a lot of information out of there, out there. Um, some good sources to look for information, International Carnivorous Plant Society. Uh, uh, they do a, uh, they have a quarterly newsletter that they, or a journal that they put out, uh, talk about cultivation, new species, um, naming uh, new cultivars that people have developed. Uh, they also have a good um, kind of education uh, section on the website on growing different carnivorous plants, go into a lot more detail than I did, uh, a lot of detail on kind of using grow lights, stuff like that. Uh, the carnivorous plant FAQ, um, the Saracenia.com is an excellent website. Again, a lot of growing information um, on there. A lot of the pictures uh, that I use in this presentation are from that website. Uh, when it comes to books, the Savage Garden, um, this is generally kind of the go-to book when it comes to growing carnivorous plants. Um, they go into cultivation of all the different species, the different requirements, uh, what they look like, and stuff like that. It's a really good book. If you really want to get into car growing carnivorous plants, uh, you should probably look into getting that book. Um, growing Carnivorous Plants by Barry Rice. Uh, he is the same person that runs the Carnivorous Plant FAQ. Again, that's another good book. goes into detail about growing carnivorous plants. Uh, and then Carnivorous Plants of the United States and Canada. Um, this doesn't really go much into cultivation. This is more... Um, about the biology of the plants. Um, and again, a lot of good information if you're interested uh, in carnivorous plants, where to find them, stuff like that. Uh, so here is my contact information. If you have any questions, um, feel free to give me a call, um, shoot me an email. Um, I will do my best to answer your questions. Um, and then if you've missed any of our past uh, Four Seasons Gardening Series, or if you want to rewatch this one, uh, we do put these up on YouTube. Uh, there's our the, the website there for that. Uh, we got all past Four Seasons. Um, and then this one should be up um, in a week or two if you want to come back and watch it again. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, um, go ahead and answer those now if there's any out there.
You're welcome. All right, it doesn't look like anybody has any questions. Uh, again, if you think of any, um, you've got my contact info. Um, feel free to get a hold of me. So thanks for uh, dialing in tonight, and enjoy the rest of your evening.